Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. My name is Sasha Koka and I am the host of KQED's weekly statewide magazine program called the California Report Magazine. Before we get started, we want to thank the club's Middle East Forum and the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit event. I am so excited for today's conversation with Netta Tului Semnani. She is an Emmy award-winning writer and producer who's currently a senior writer with the TV news magazine, Vice News Tonight. And she is also the author of the new book, They Said They Wanted Revolution, A Memoir of My Parents. It is a heartfelt and gorgeous book that reflects on her family's emotional experience of the Iranian revolution and the story of her parents who were radicalized at Berkeley in the 1960s and 70s and left the US in 1979 to join the revolution. And that was a decision that ultimately changed the course of Netta's life. We are gonna be talking about a lot over the next hour. And I also wanna be sure to ask Netta your questions too. So if you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube and I will be sure to get to them later in the program. But to start us off, let me just give a warm welcome to you, Netta Tului Samnani. It's so great to see you. Thank you. It's so good to see you, Sasha. Thanks so much. Well, welcome to the Commonwealth Club. Let me start off by asking you, um, since we at the Commonwealth Club and, and KQED are based here in California, I want to talk about Berkeley in the 1960s, which is a big part of this book. It's where your parents met. Um, your mom was a teenager who was born in Iran, but who came to Monterey uh, because your grandmother, who was an exceptionally independent woman, uh, emigrated uh, as a divorcee in the 1950s. Just tell me a little bit about her and about your mom and how she found her way to Berkeley. My grandmother was um, one of the coolest ladies I've ever met. Um and I'm lucky she was my grandmother, but she, yes, she was, um, she and my grandfather divorced in the mid 1950s. Um, and then around the time after the, the 1953 coup, um, the U S became kind of entrenched in Iran. And one of the ways that they did that was to help students get visas to bring them from Tehran to the U.S. to study for training, lots of things. So my grandmother was one of that, uh, one of those students who did those early waves of immigrating for a student visa. She um, took her kids. She had three kids. My mom was the youngest um, and left them with her her mother, my great grandmother in Tehran. And then, you know, she, she took a passage to California. She started in San Francisco um, and she finished her uh, bachelor's degree and she supported herself in all sorts of ways, including working in, um, in a factory pitting peaches. And yeah, and then eventually she became a linguist. She did her graduate degree and she went down to, um, and then she started bringing the kids over one by one. My aunt, my mother's older sister was the first one. Then my mother came over in the late fifties when she was 10. And then my uncle, uh, was the last one. Um, and he was the middle child. Uh, and then after she got a job at the defense language Institute, that's when she brought my uncle, she brought the family down to, to Monterey. And essentially my mother spent her teenage years, uh, in Monterey, uh, with the single mother, for a lot of them who was working for the U.S. military, uh, teaching language, teaching Farsi. Um, so it was, so my mom was really different, uh, or at least that was her experience of growing up in kind of coastal California. Um, even though where they were because of the language institute was relatively diverse, relatively international, mom always felt a little bit out of place. Um, 
And then, you know, she left school and like most of us do, we find our way to college. Um, and eventually, if we're lucky, we find our tribe, which is what happened when mom got to first San Jose State. And then when she got to Berkeley, it really kind of hit for her. And she also met your dad at Berkeley. He was a student who came from Iran to study first in the Midwest and then to Berkeley. And in this book, you just paint such a, an evocative picture of what Berkeley was like at that time. In fact, I'd love to show our audience a picture of your parents and their friends at Berkeley in 1969. You really get a sense of the flavor of that period. Um, and I'd love to have you read us a passage about your mom's very first day in Berkeley. Absolutely. So this, just for, just for fun, I'll show you the picture of the book. <laughs> um, <clears throat> On that day in Berkeley, she walked hurriedly down Telegraph Avenue. She had a quick, funny gait heels in, toes out. It pitched her hips back and forth in a way that was a little tomboyish and a little suggestive. She found the sublet, which belonged to a young couple who were visiting Iran for a few months. The apartment was essentially a small room, but my mother took it to share with another Iranian girl, I'll call Naz, who was a few years older than she, the little sister of a friend. The girls moved into the studio with the love seat, milk crates, a phone, and a turntable. They slapped fat psychedelic flower decals on the walls and pulled down the Murphy bed to share. That summer, their apartment was where everyone gathered on their way to the Iran house, the meeting place for all the Iranian student association chapters in Northern California, a couple blocks away. Do you remember falling for your friends? Do you remember the rush of it, the delight of it, the relief and the joy of it, the feeling was, of course, of course, of course. The feeling was one of being found, finally. Found in a way that made you realize you had been lost, floating aimlessly in a too big world. The feeling was, I'm not alone, not any longer. I'm not a freak. I am accepted and I accept in return. Life became an exclamation point. The blood sang and the heart expanded. So it was for my mother and so it was for my father, and so it would be for me. Hmm, that's beautiful. And of course, your mom and your dad met each other. And I think we've got another photo um, from that time of them, for those of you who know Berkeley, um, of them in Tilden Park in Berkeley. And the two of them became part of an increasingly leftist group of Iranian students. Tell us about how the climate of Berkeley in the 60s influenced your parents politically. Yeah, so Berkeley, um, well, I mean, it's important to think of, to realize you had said my dad came in the mid 60s or in the early 60s rather. So like I said, my grandmother was one wave. Um, my mother's siblings were another wave. And my father came right at the, in the early sixties. So it was like the beginning of the, you know, the civil rights movement really taking off. And he landed in the Midwest. Um, my father kind of like the rest of the country in 1967, kind of headed towards Berkeley. And 1967 was classically the summer of, they called the summer of love. It was the year. Um, and there were so many people coming to the Bay Area at that time. And of course, at that time, there was um, the San Francisco Sound and all of that. But on top of that, there was this burgeoning and, and increasingly um, uh, this increasingly important anti-war movement, right? Like that was really happening around the um, Vietnam. But you also had groups like the Black Panthers taking off towards the end of the 60s. So my parents and their friends were coming to the States around this time and really getting soaking in the climate of it. Um, so, you know, Berkeley at that time was definitely left, but as you got into the seventies, it became more and more, uh, it went further to the left. So you went from being Marxist Leninist to being, you know, closer. And eventually most people were Maoists who were politically active at that time. Um, and that was true of people that were in the um, 
the SDS and uh, Students, Students for, for Democratic Society. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and and my parents, it was true for my parents as well. They weren't political. Um, they became political the longer they stayed at Berkeley and as they were increasingly a part of the uh, Iranian Student Association and the anti-Shah movement, which also kind of um, ran parallel to the American um, anti-war movement actually the global anti-war movement, but yeah. And, so, And as you were researching this book, you actually came across archival footage of protests um, and, you know, including when these Iranian students took over the Iranian consulate in San Francisco, other protests, and you actually discovered your mother in one of those films, right? Yeah, I did. It was, um, the experience of researching and reporting this book is kind of like, I'm sure this is true for everybody who writes uh, or reports a memoir, but um, it felt very surreal because my parents had both had passed away by the time I started working on this book. But I would have these moments where I would be Googling something. Um, and I believe that footage of the protest that you talk about was in the KQED database. But mm-hmm. um, so it would be something like Iranian student protesting. And in this case, I clicked on it and um, it was a strange bit of tape. I must have in my head, it must be like the scraps of news footage or something on a newsroom floor that somebody put together. It was very weird. And then up popped my mother, who was so young at the time. She was in her early 20s. Um, and it was about a week before my parents got married. And so there was all these times grafted onto this random piece of footage that it felt like I had... Um, I had thrown sort of uh, my fishing rod into the great wide internet and had come back with my mom kind of starting to figure out who she was. And I say in the book, like her mannerisms weren't quite what they would be later, but you could kind of see shadows of the way she walked and the way she held herself and her voice. Um, and it was a, it's a really emotional thing. I think for most of us who were born into families where it feels like our parents were kind of you know, just sprung out that way. Um, And you always think, or at least I always thought, God, I wish I would have known them when they were younger. Um, And so it was a funny way of actually getting to know my parents as they were younger. Our kids Um, aren't going to have that problem, right? With all the videos and phones. I think about that all (laughs) the time, truly all the time. Um, But this was my version of that. It was just such a surprise. Um, And in fact, not that long ago, maybe mm, five or six months ago when I was doing maybe a little longer, the final kind of fact checks of the book, I found a tape of my father um, just tucked away on on YouTube somewhere. And it was the first time I had seen him walking around that I can remember. So that was also, but it was another one of those protest footage and all of a sudden there was. Um, So there, there were moments like that all through putting this book together. Help, help us understand what the vision was of these Iranian radical students. They wanted to overthrow the Shah. Yeah, of they Iran. did. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, yeah. So, you know, everybody came into the, the anti-Shah movement from different from sort of different um, angles in. Um, some students, you know, came to college and that was kind of, you know, they would go to protests or they would go to demonstrations or they would go to lectures or whatever. And that was about the extent of it. Other people, um, the message of the anti-Shah movement really resonated, which was, you know, here was a ally of the U.S. who, um, and the Shah's family um, was essentially governing the country and there was a certain group of people who were also governing but the we were it was a monarchy so the voice of the people was almost non-existent um uh while you know during that period they the shah outlawed for example um political political parties so there was one political party essentially for the whole country and um 
you know, there was, there was a great deal of poverty. There's a great deal of concern over literacy. There was, you know, there was need, in other words, there was need in the country that the people, that these young people felt like weren't being addressed. And they also felt like they didn't have a voice because they didn't. Essentially, political dissent was outlawed, which is why it was happening outside of the country. Um, by the time, by the early 1970s, in fact, it was illegal for Iranian students to be a part of the Confederation, um, the which is the anti-Shah movement or the student anti-Shah student movement was the Confederation. So, um, so there was a lot of reasons I think that people felt both sort of politicized and angry. Um, and then also they were outside of the country where they could kind of organize and speak out and act and sort of act with 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 a certain amount of, um, yeah, with the political bent for sure. Um, so that, you know, and then on top of that, there was, this was like the period where other countries, other nations were going through their own independence movements. And I'm not saying Iran was an independence movement, but it's sort of like tacked to that. Um, and so, yeah, so there was something about the global 60s that really resonated with this group of people, these young group of people, and they became a really significant part of that political um, arm of the global 60s. And you know, unlike many Iranian Americans who came to the U.S. Um, after the revolution, your parents actually went back to Iran because mm -hmm. they wanted to help usher in what they thought could be this new society based on their leftist ideals. But that's not what happened. Tell us how that idealism faded and and what ended up happening. Um, I think, I think for us, when a big you know, historical event uh, happens, it seems almost inevitable that it should be this way. You know, like the Iranian revolution happened. It seemed inevitable now with hindsight that, you know, it would have become an Islamic revolution, that the Ayatollah would have taken charge. But in fact, that wasn't necessarily true at the time. Um, the people who were part of this coalition were the Islamists, it's true, but it's also people who didn't particularly, they weren't communist and weren't Islamists. Um, so that was one group. Um, there were the people who were on the left, like my parents. Um, there were guerrilla movements that were more militant. There were lots of, in other words, there were lots of different groups who had gotten together, who had worked kind of um, either officially work together or kind of work together in, in the, as this broad coalition to overthrow the monarchy, to overthrow that kind of rule of law. Um, and when my parents went back, there's really great stories that I just found really kind of, I don't know, there was something about it that was bittersweet about these young people kind of... Um, boarding all these planes coming in from the U.S. and from Europe, and um, and they would be full of, of these young people who had finally gotten this thing that they'd been working for, for some of them for 15 years, you know, and or longer. And they would be singing um, revolutionary anthems, and they would be, it felt like a party, and it was just like, you know, like the way that people talk about it just sounds like something out of, I don't know, a movie or a story that you've been told. And of course they land. And my mother said, um, you could tell all of a sudden the Islamists went one way. It felt like you could see like the, the rift start as soon as you touched ground in Tehran. Um, so those early weeks and months in Tehran, early weeks, I would say, were ideal, was exactly what my mom thought they would be, for example. There were a ton of newspapers opening. People were talking. They were arguing. There was dissent happening. But at the same time, Khomeini, the Ayatollah Khomeini, was also starting to solidify power. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so those early months had this like flavor of this is what we've been working for. And at the same time, the Islamists were, and with the Ayatollah Khomeini as a leader, were, were really taking um, charge, but it would take a little while for everything to kind of um, calcify. Mm -hmm. um, and by that point, by the time that my parents really realized what was happening, they had had a child 
Um, and you. Yeah, you. Me. <laughs> <laughs> me. I had been born. Um, and this was true for a lot of people. You know, they had come back thinking that this was going to be sort of this new world that they or new country that they had um you know, agitated for so long to get. And so they started doing those big optimistic things like starting a family. And, and within, you know, a year or two, um, they were trying to figure out how to either influence the government, the Islamic government republic, um, either through, you know, political actions, which were much more dangerous once they were in Iran for lots of reasons, but also they had a lot more to lose with having children and everything like that. And then um, eventually my parents' organization, there was a faction who decided that they wanted to organize essentially in a, a violent, upper, a, an insurgency. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what happened. And that, um, so yeah. And at that point, at that point, it really, um, your parents kind of moved away from your dad, especially moved away from that faction. And it became quite dangerous for your family to stay yeah. in Iran. Right. Yeah. My mom, um, sort of started disengaging earlier than my father. She had, um, from before uh, she became part of this movement, she really wanted to go back to Iran and teach English. She had this idea that she was going to be a teacher. And that's um, so as all there was all this like turmoil, political turmoil happening around her, she was also starting to disengage. She was focusing more on, well, I mean, becoming a mother for one thing, but also she was starting a language school with her friend. And so that was, and she was watching my father waiting for him to kind of come with her out of the movement. Okay. We've done what we've wanted to do, but now it's time for us to, to get on with it, to get on with our life. And there was a lot of grief, I think with that. Um, but there was, there was also, my mom wanted her family to be together in Iran, I think. Um, so when, so when this faction started organizing, um, and my father was against this idea of this violent uprising, this insurgency, essentially, um, my, my mother thought that he would start making like a more formal, we're going to leave. Um, and he didn't, and it took he was, you know, he didn't have the later leadership position that he once did. He was kind of phased out, pushed out of the movement, his organization. Um, but he he never fully left. He didn't, for example, resign. And that was something that we paid for. He paid for um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Right. Because what ended up happening is um, the Ayatollah's forces came after your dad uh, mm -hmm. and arrested him. And at that point, you and your very pregnant mom, she was pregnant with your brother, mm -hmm. um, had to try to leave and, and get out. Um, and you were what, two at that point? Two years old? I was almost three. Um, almost three? Almost three years old. Yeah. Um, I think we yeah, have a photo. I... I just wanted to show the photo of you um, and your relatives. You can't really see people's faces, but it's your mom and your aunt and your uncle. Um, and you all are packing the suitcases that you thought you would be able to carry with you out. Um, and you ended up having to go by horseback into Turkey, which is some of the most arresting uh, descriptions that you have in this book are, are of the journey um, that you guys made. You were so young at that time, but you have these fleeting impressions. Can you just tell us what you remember from that time and also what you reconstructed through mm. interviewing your family members about that escape? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that section took a lot of years to kind of put together. Um, I don't remember, like I said, I, my memories, um, kind of kick in when we get to the States. Um, so I have impressions um, and more feelings um, about the escape. Um, and, you know, I mean, it is always going to be a sadness for, for me that my memories didn't kick in earlier. But um, so I had to reconstruct the whole 
thing. I was very, the whole um, escape, my father's arrest, his and the escape um, from from Iran into Turkey and then to the U.S. Um, and those were all done by, through interviews, a lot of research, um, and, and just being very lucky that my um, aunt, my mother's sister had interviewed my mother for, um, for her, a book she wrote many years ago called Women in Exile. And um, they had spent a long time talking about the escape. And it was at that point about nine years after nine, maybe nine or 10 years after. So it was long further away that there was distance and she was able to talk about it, but it was, um, it was still, I mean, it wasn't, it hadn't faded, I would say. Um, so she had a lot of really good details in that. And I spent a long time, it was about eight hour, maybe interview, um, with that, but also everybody else in that, uh, went through the escape with us was, is alive. So I spent a lot of time and they were so generous giving me, um, access to journals, to their memories, letting me interview them sometimes over and over again about certain scenes. Um, and then I went to Vaughn, which is, um, a town, um, on the border between Iran and, and Turkey. Um, it's on the Turkish side and it's, that's still a smuggling route. Um, I mean, right now for Iranians, but also for Afghans. So it's, um, it was a really interesting, uh, reporting trip. And, and I found someone that took me to the, took me basically to the border. So I was able to kind of retrace some of the, some parts of it, um, not on foot, obviously, but I was able to do it. But yeah, I mean, my mother, was seven months pregnant when we left. And they all thought um, that picture shows, I think it shows the suitcases. So we, there's, there was a lot of suitcases. We, we were going away in a car, we thought, and we thought it would be just a few hours because um, that's how we thought it was going to be. And it turned out that we only went uh, with a car for part of it. Most of it was done on horseback. Um, at night without light. Cause again, it was a smuggling route and, and a lot of it was on foot. We were hidden in, um, in stables and, and eventually, uh, abandoned by the smugglers. Um, they stole, uh, some of our stuff, but we lost some stuff along the way, including we had left the baby's formula. My, my infant, my cousin, five month old cousin was with us. Um, and it was just a harrowing, harrowing journey. Um, and, but we eventually, and this part, I don't know why it really hit me to know that we walked into Vaughn safely, all six of us, um, like broken and haggard and all that. But, you know, we walked in on our own two feet or well, they did. I, probably was being carried, but there's something about that image that always, you know, when life is, is kind of weighing me down, I think about that. Um, there's something mm -hmm. about like the resiliency and the strength of, of humanity and of people. And when things are really hard that in my head, that image encapsulates, um, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, seeing the images of young kids right now after the invasion of Ukraine, you know, coming across borders and largely being with their female relatives, their moms or their aunts like you were, I mean, I can imagine that that really resonates. Even if you don't remember that viscerally somewhere within you, you know that you lived that kind of experience and trauma as a young refugee kid. And I, you know, I wonder if you think this book, um, kind of sheds light on or gives readers a lens on something more universal than just, you know, the experience after the Iranian revolution, but, but really maybe more worldwide. I mean, I hope so. I think so. I, I hope so. That's part of my real like hope for this book is that, um, you can pick it up and yeah, it's true. It's about, um, a certain period in history and there's a lot of reporting and research and personal, you know, excavation that went into it. But ultimately it's, I think a story of a child trying to figure out why, 
she had to move somewhere and rebuild and what it means to be a resilient child, essentially. Um, and I was really lucky, I think, that as a kid, I spent a lot of time um, writing journals. And so the third part of this book is essentially you, you, there's excerpts from journals and, um, and emails and letters um, from the time I was eight until uh, 39, 40, I think. Um, so one of the reasons I did that is because I think as a child, when you were as young as I am, or I was, um, and I think about this when I'm watching, um, I mean, I'm still a journalist, so I, co you know, help cover conflicts like this. Um, and I have covered Afghanistan and now Ukraine. And as I'm watching these young kids um, with their parents, and not just that, like the migrant crisis in South or Latin America and South America. I mean, there is so much movement of people over time and space right now. And I always think about children who don't have words, how they make sense of being taken from one place and moved to another place. Because it's not just a matter of picking somebody up and plopping them down somewhere else. Um, in my case, for example, I didn't speak English. Um, and for lots of reasons, one of which was my mother was had an infant and her husband um, was on trial uh, facing his <laughs> execution. Um, my mom put me in daycare right away. And so I couldn't speak the language. And also I had just gone through this thing where I had been taken away from my family. Um, and so there was always a story when I was younger of me sitting on my teacher's lap, um, crying, czar, czar, we say, czar, czar, crying on my teacher's lap, wondering where my mother was and asking for her over and over again. And it was a funny story when I was younger. Um, but now that I'm older and I've read all my journals and I've watched myself through the years and through the process of putting this book together, trying to figure out where where they went, why they went, how we got here, where was I responsible for any parts of this, um, and, and try to figure out how to kind of integrate that experience into the whole of me. I think uh, this book goes somewhere, some way, I hope, towards showing how a child might do that. And I think I was lucky in that I kept these journals because mm -hmm. it wasn't filtered through an adult. You know what I mean? Like these mm -hmm. were the words and the feelings of a, you know, of a kid. Um, and, and I hope that the reader can watch her grow up. Um, that's my hope anyway. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I really, it's, it's really hard, especially as a mother now, but it's really hard watching this because it's almost one of the things that I know is that that escape, that trauma reverberated through our family, um, the good and the bad of it, um, for it's still reverberating, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're talking about this now. Um, and yeah. when I think about the, the movement of time and place, of people over time and place now, I think about how that's going to reverberate for them um, and all those millions of stories that Absolutely. they need to tell. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much research, right, into epigenetic trauma and passing it down and what all those migrations mean for all of us who are children of immigrants or immigrants ourselves. Um, I do want to make sure we include um, a bit about your father. We've talked a lot about your mom. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you, you said that he had a trial, a very public trial um, after his arrest, and he was eventually executed um, and killed by the Ayatollah's forces. You were, again, very young when this happened. Um, but uh, there's so much in here about the deep love and connection that you did have with him as an infant and a toddler, and also the rebuilding of that relationship almost um, through researching who he was and interviewing your family. And yeah, so I'd love to um, to hear what you learned about your dad in the process of researching this book. And as you tell us about that, I'd like to cue up another photo, um, which is a black and white photo of you and your dad. Um, I think your baby in this picture. It's yeah. very sweet. 
<laughs> I, um, I think it was, you know, one of the, I guess, side effects of my dad being um, uh, a political organizer and an activist in Iran when it was quite dangerous to be was he was underground most of the time um, for most of my life with him. So he was kind of the primary caretaker. So it would be he and I um, for, you know, most days and he would do things um, you mean you guys were like hiding out? We once he we, once the Ayatollah's forces were looking for him, you guys would be in a house somewhere. Yeah, we were. Your mom a, would be out doing her English classes or whatever. Yeah, we were in what we call what I call a safe house. Like no one was supposed to know where we lived, and um, yeah, so it was that's yeah exactly. So no one was supposed to know where we were, um, and so Dad would. Um, do things like he would take, I don't know, these cartoon, he would draw cartoons for me and then tell me stories. I used to have a book of all of these drawings that he and mm-hmm. I did. Um, and so I think I credit a lot of my kind of my storytelling the fact that I wanted to be a writer all my life because because so much of our relationship when I was a child was about telling stories and him telling me stories and me telling him stories. Um, but yeah, when, when he was on trial, the trial, it's very surreal. You can find the trial on YouTube. Um, and I was lucky enough that someone got, um, smuggled out, which was what was essentially, um, kind of all the documents, including the trial transcripts, but some of like the evidence um, that they had against, it wasn't just my father. He was on trial with almost two dozen other people or yeah, about 22 other people. Um, And, and so, and they were tried together at the prison. Um, So I had grown up seeing pictures of this. I had grown up being kind of told things now and then about the trial, but it was really much, much different when I finally got the transcript and I had the transcript translated before I saw the the footage mm-hmm. that somebody put online years after I had seen the transcript. Um, and I had my father's last letter um, that he wrote the night before he was, he was executed. Um, and I had never had that translated until kind of, I had, I had the translator translate both of them at once. And it was really interesting because I had done so much reporting and so much research and then having my father kind of explain in his own words, um, to some extent, uh, a lot of things that are, that I had learned on my own was like a really strange and profound experience. Um, but also it was, you know, he had been, he had been in prison at that point, almost six months, maybe six months. Um, so he was, I have a picture from him a week before he left, um, before he was arrested and, and the image of him at his trial. And, and that change was so profound and it was so quick that that was also, so anyway, putting together that portion of the book was in lots of ways, a very profound and very like, Mm difficult experience, but the process of learning about my dad, of talking about him, of talking to people, whether they liked him or not, or were friends with him or not, was it made him this full-fledged human, you know? Um, I got to know his habits a little bit. I got to know how his laugh sounded. I went and found his, the place where he lived in college. I, I got to see all these places and kind of in my head, I mapped it to, and and literally I mapped it to pictures of where he was. So I almost got to see him grow up um, in this way. I mean, it was as close as I could get to growing up with a parent where they kind of tell you about themselves as you're going. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah, but um, yeah. Um, we're getting a lot of audience questions and I want to make sure we have time for some of them, but I also know that you have a passage that you want to share with us. Just one final passage you want to read. And it's, um, we should explain that, you know, you, you finished this book while you were pregnant with your son. It was a book that took you many years to write. 
but the ending of this book is a message to him. So I'd love to have you share that with us. And then we can get to some of these wonderful questions that are coming in from the audience. Um, so this, this part of the book was when I didn't know what to say, I sat down and wrote this, um, about why I was writing this book. Um, so <clears throat> whoever you are, whoever you are, whoever you may be, maybe you, it doesn't matter who you are. I want you, whoever you are to hear this. Whoever you are, I want you, because I need to, to tell you, I need to tell you a story, to write you a story. I will find you and read you this story. If you can't hear and don't read, I want to show the story to you, this story. But I do want you. I want you to try to read, to see, to listen, to the story about me. It is about me. A little bit. It is a little bit about me, but it isn't only. It is a story about a lot, about a lot of people, people I know and people I never will. It is a story, many stories really, about place and places and some of the people who moved between those, who moved across those lines, who crossed those lines. It is a story a story about people who move between places and through time. It is about the past, about journeys I stitched together, scrap by scrap, until the present came through. I wove them in, into a story, a story I made from wisps gathered from here and there, wisps threaded through an eye, pierced into a scene, leading from then into later. It might explain how now is. It might explain today some. That is how the story was built, but it is a tale about, about how things began. I want to tell you what was built and how it was broken. I want to tell you about what we lost, about what I lost, about those lost. I want to tell you all the, all the things lost to me and to you, about all the loss loss that built up like scum on a window and dust on a ledge. I want to tell you about all the loss swept together, piled loss on top of loss until it became something, something scattered, scattered like seeds, something like life, something like lives, something like diaspora. I will tell you about those who dispersed, about the dispersed, about those who came apart together, and those who then came together, about the ones who lived, who lived through the losing, who lived throughout the loosening, who wound themselves tight, who tightened and bruised, who became a new thing. I will tell you some things about them. Mm, beautiful. Um, let me pivot to questions from our audience. We're getting in a lot of great questions. Um, one of them is pretty simple. You mentioned that you you know, traveled to many places around the globe to research this book. Did you go back to Iran or have you been back to Iran um, in the process of researching this book? Yes. Not for the book. Um, I went back to Iran in 2003, 2004 um, when I was, I guess even then I had an idea that I wanted to write something about this um, story, but I, yeah, no, it was just, it was after college um, and I had felt a little bit lost, I think. Um, and so I thought I would go back to Iran and maybe I would have that connection that my mother had. My mother talks about um, having landed in Iran and felt all of a sudden whole again somehow. Um, I didn't have that. It, experience, but it was a profound and beautiful experience. And it really did, um, I feel like I'm using the word profound a lot. Um, it really did kind of shape who I was, who I am. Um, it shaped a lot of my choices in my twenties. So I think my mother and I in, in different ways had, uh, a, an experience of Iran that kind of set us on, on our path. Hmm. Another audience member says this book is both informational and personal. What was the most challenging part for you to write? And what was the most rewarding part? 
I think the most challenging part was figuring out what my story was and what was for kind of what parts belong to other people. You know, I think as a journalist, if you're writing about a story, you kind of just, you let the story kind of take you. But in this, in this particular um, situation, I felt like I was trying to kind of ride the line between what I needed in order to answer the questions for myself, answer the questions that I thought a reader would want to know. Um, and then also accept the fact that some of this isn't my story to tell. Like, you know, I was pushing, I was talking to people who have a very strong relationship. This is their story as much it is, as it is my mother's, my father's, mine. Um, and so when, what to kind of leave, <laughs> what not to push on. And then, um, and then how to be really humble when I was asking for people to share with me. Um, mm. It was actually a really good training as a journalist. Well, right. Do. Cause you were trying to approach it as a journalist, but really these were your family members and you can't just, you didn't have that, you know, objectivity hat on, right. This was, you had to yeah. abandon that. There's a point I think in the book where you talk about how your uncle was like, mm -mm, you're not going to talk to me like a reporter. This is, <laughs> um, so that, that dovetails with another question uh, from an audience member. Can you share what the response has been to your book? Have people reached out to you that knew your parents or other family members? Yeah, actually um, they have. It's been really, I mean, uh, the, the response has been kind of amazing in, in some ways. Some people have, a lot, in the beginning, I was getting a lot of emails from people who were American and had um, gone to college in the States with Iranians and had kind of wondered what happened um, to people that they knew on campus or who were political or whatever. And this sort of gave them some closure. Um, I also heard from a lot of people, like I said, like myself, who were children of diaspora, refugees, a lot Um and who had decided to talk to their own family, to their own parents, um, which was really satisfying. Um, and then more recently, people have reached out who knew my mother, who um, knew other people in the movement, who knew my father, who had, hadn't had heard their parents talk about their own relationship or, or role in, in the Confederation and the anti-Shah movement. Um, so that's, been the last, you know, few weeks. And then, you know, even today I've been getting emails asking, you know, I went to high school with your uncle. Can I help, <laughs> can you help me get in touch with them or something? So it's been a full gamut. I mean, um, I think the, the responses that mean, I mean, they all mean a lot to me. People have reached out. There's people that have reached out who are mothers who have said that the, you know, the things I write to my son and for my son have meant a lot to them. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a really amazing kind of experience to have been toiling away on something for almost a decade and having so many different types of people connect to mm. it. I'm going to fold two audience questions together because they're sort of similar. One is, was there anything that you learned about your parents that you would have rather left unknown? And the second one related, but not the same is, is there a question or story that you wish you could have asked your mom and your dad or your dad? Mm, um, to the first question, no, i I think there were some things I learned that felt hard to know at the time. And now they, I've made my peace with them. I think, I think the hardest part is that I don't know so many things, you know, like I can't, I have a lot of questions about like certain events that I want to know more about, or why did you do this versus that? Or, you know, yeah, that's, you know, that's the hard part of not, of having the two essentially protagonists or main characters, um, not be around for me to ask some pretty serious follow-up questions. <laughs> um, but no, there was nothing. I was really worried that there would be parts of it uh, that I would uncover something. My brother would was constantly warning me, uh, like, you're going to, you might find out something that you don't want to know. And then you get, how would you unknow it? Um, but it turns out that 
you can accept people for who they are. And I think for me in this case, I have to accept my parents with just so much that I don't know. So many blank spots that I just will never know. Um, you know, some of the things that I wish I could ask my mom, for example, is I will never know. And if anybody out there does know what my mom was doing in Yemen, please, please tell me. I am dying to know what she was doing in Yemen. Um, I want to know what, you know, my father had written her a letter when they had they had spent a year apart to kind of win her back. And whatever he said in that letter did the trick. And I want to know, it's not maybe my business, but I still want to know what's in the letter. <laughs> what kind of convinced him or convinced her rather? Um, I want to know, I don't God, so much. I, it's like, I don't know. The list is so long. I think, I think what's true though, is um, whether your parents, die when you're young or much older, you're going to wake up the next day and have 10 questions to ask them. So, hmm. um, Here's another question. Now that the book is out, is there a story you wish you could have included in the final version? Something you know, that maybe you had to cut? Yeah. Um, I had, in fact, I had forgotten about this section because I had cut it uh, so long ago, but my husband remembered it. Um, when he read the book, he said, oh, I, you know, I've changed a lot or something. And he said, but I had expected this one part. When I was in Iran in 2003, one of the first trips I did was to go to Kerman, which is where my um, mother's family was from. And from Kerman, we went to this town, um, a city called Bam. And um, Bam had this fortified um kind of city. Uh, it was kind of made of mud and um, other, it was, it was like, a, I don't know, a soil and dirt and whatever, but it was beautiful and it was ancient. It was thousands of years old and it was perfectly preserved. And it was, so it was my first month in Iran and it was a really just, I don't know, I was there at sunset and I was, you know, we had just driven across the desert and it was this moment of feeling, you know, the, the weight of history and the weight, the passage of time. And, um, and then I was working in, in a nonprofit, uh, while I was in Iran and not two, three months later, there was the earthquake that destroyed mm -hmm. BAM, including that, um, the Citadel, the Agabam. And that was such and then I ended up working in BAM in kind of earth, the earthquake relief. And it was such a important part of my life, but that I had written a lot um, about that trip, that early trip to Kerman and to BAM. And so that was a part of the book. And I wish, I mean, it didn't make sense in the narrative, but I, it, it was such a, I don't know, it was an important part of, for me, of my life, apart from mm -hmm. the story. Another question, how did the Iranian students influence the revolutionary movement in the U.S.? You talked about how they were influenced by groups like SDS or the Black Panthers, but what was the influence you think the Iranian student movement left on the U.S.? There's also a recommendation that Bob Avakian's book From Ike to Mao speaks to Berkeley in this time period. Oh, yeah. Um, so the Iranian students were really good at organizing. They could, um, they did a couple things. I mean, they did a lot of things really well, but they were, um, I had been told that if, for example, if SDS or if anybody needed to do, to put together a demonstration really quickly, the Iranian students on campus would be kind of the, the people that could, could turn out, <laughs> turn out bodies too. Um, they were, I mean, obviously maybe not, obviously they were highly educated. They had a lot of free time and they were deeply committed to this, to a cause, um, that it wasn't just about the anti-Shah movement. Right. So, um, so a lot of the tactics that they were doing would overlap with, um, with stuff that was happening with the anti-war movement, civil rights movement. And so there was this 
back and forth influence um, between the Iranian students and and the rest of these groups. In Europe, it was probably almost more palpable. Um, in there was a series of protests in Germany where a protester had died. It was like this big moment in the global 60s. Mm-hmm. And that protest was um, the the students from around, um, around the city had come out in protest of the Shah. So there were moments like this throughout the 19th, the, the 60s where these big protests were happening. And then you would dig in a little bit and you found out that, you know, there was this anti-Shah element to it. Um, so it was, and then the, the, the Iranian students were really interesting because they were able to do, to organize over without like the technology that we have now oh, across countries. They were able to get around borders and stuff. They were able to use technology to their own benefit. And part of that is by sharing information. They spent a lot of time, um, making these sort of um, collecting news from around the world that they would put together in these sort of, um, it was almost like omnibus newspapers and, mm-hmm. and distribute that. So they, they spent a lot of time kind of sharing information, um, developing theories, um, and then organizing. They were just like one of the best organizer uh, groups for organizing. Um, mm-hmm. that was working outside of the country and then in the U.S. and in Europe. Fascinating. Well, we've reached the point in our program where we have time for just one more audience question, and I'm going to ask you this one. Can you talk about the book cover? Were you involved in the design? Um, I was kind of involved. I mean, I um, the artist who did it is um, a woman. Uh, she's called Mina Jafari. Um, and she is a DC based artist. She's Iranian. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the most I did was when they asked me who, if I had an idea of the artist I wanted, I wanted Mina to do it because I loved her work. Um, and she sent me a couple, um, she sent, you know, the team, like a couple versions, a mock-up, but no, this was Mina's work. It was absolutely, I, I love it. I, I can't, it's like something out of my dreams. Yeah, it's amazing. But no, that's all Mina. <laughs> well, Neda, you have also produced an incredibly beautiful book. And I just want to thank you for talking about it with us, for sharing it with us. Um, I, as Neda knows, both read the book and listened to the audio book back and forth because I was so absorbed when I didn't have time to physically read it. I was walking and listening to it. It's just completely consuming. And so I want to thank you for joining us today and for talking about your new book. Again, it's called They Said They Wanted Revolution, A Memoir of My Parents. And we encourage all of you to pick up a copy of Netta's book at your local bookstore. If you would like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making in-person and virtual programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. Netta to Louis Samnani, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks, Sasha. This really was great. It. it was wonderful. And thanks to all of you in our audience. I'm Sasha Koka. Thank you and take care.